Hello, my name is Daniela, and I will be reading the scripture reading today from Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 8. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Good morning, everybody. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to Romans 12, please. Maybe you're already there because Daniela just read it. What I have here are my eyeglasses. So what I want to do here, I just want, I'm going to pass these around. Be careful with them. This is my only pair. I wear contact lenses, but uh, sometimes I have to wear glasses. So uh, put them on just for a second, look around, see what you see, and then pass them around. The goal is for everybody to kind of take a moment to look there. So uh, start with George, and he's got to pass it around. Uh, balcony, I don't know if it's going to get to you or not. You guys may want to jump down here and, and grab the glasses, or you can just use your imagination. All right, so we are in uh, Romans 12. That's what we're going to be looking at today. Uh, let's see here. Here. Okay, maybe you guys just advance when I let you know. All right. Oh, we're good. Let's see. There we go. All right. All right, we're good to go. All right. So a couple years ago. I heard about an opportunity to serve at a youth event. Uh, the event was going to be downtown. It was going to be during and after a Cleveland Monsters game. It was going to have hundreds of kids uh, with the chance to hear the gospel, uh, and they needed people to help. So I heard about this. I, I, I thought this is a great way for me to use my gifts to serve God and to serve the body of Christ. So I signed up to help out at it. And that's really what we're talking about today in Romans 12. The pastor we're going to be looking at, uh, Romans 12, 3 to 8, the passage that Daniela read is about uh, using our God-given gifts to serve. All right, so I want to start from verse 3, uh, and we'll go from there. So let me read verse 3. Verse 3 says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. All right, let me pray and then we'll jump in. Lord, thank you for today. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, open your word and to be uh, transformed by it, Lord. Pray that we'd have welcoming hearts to the truths of your word. Help me to speak clearly. Help us to listen well and just to, to know how it is you want us to apply your word to our lives this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so it's interesting and instructive, really, that when Paul opens up a discussion about gifts and abilities, look at where he starts. He says, don't think too highly of yourself. Don't think more highly of, uh, than you ought to think, it says, but rather think with sober judgment, it says, according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. See, and maybe a lot of us know this, but it's good to be reminded of it. We have a tendency to inflate our own value. Think about it. What do we need to know in order to accept the gospel, in order to accept the fact that Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead. And the gospel is Christ died, from the, died for our sins and rose from the dead. But in order to accept that, we first need to come to the realization that we're not as good as we thought we were. That we have sins that we've committed against a holy God. People in general tend to think, hey, I'm a pretty good person. Well, the gospel turns this whole thing on its head. It says that God has created a standard and he expects perfection to that standard. And because we cannot reach that standard, and because our sins need to be punished, 
He provided Jesus to die in, in the place of anyone willing to accept his substitutionary sacrifice. This means then that as believers, as followers of Christ, our value is tied to the fact that God created me and Christ saved me. That is what gives me value. Not the things that I've done or the things that I will do. That's why we saw last week in Romans 12, 1. What does Paul say? He said, I appeal to you by the mercies of God. In light of the mercy of God upon us, we ought to present ourselves as a living sacrifice. That's the passage that we looked at last week. The motivation is the mercies of God. What did Jared say? The indicative comes before the imperative, right? The indicatives, the gospel, which Paul here in, in 12, 1, just sums up as the mercies of God. It says, by the mercies of God, that's the motivation to present ourselves as living sacrifices. That's our motivation. So the general command to be a living sacrifice that we looked at last week, it's going to get into some specifics for really the rest of the book of Romans. And now in verse 3 to 8, what does it mean to become a living sacrifice? Now is applied to the specific case of ministry in the church, serving one another. <clears throat> so then in verse 3, he says, don't think too highly of yourself. Think rightly of yourself. I am a sinner saved by the grace of a God who loves me and wants me to serve in his body. That's who I am. John Piper comments on verse 3 this way. He says, the Christian alternative to thinking too highly of ourselves is mainly to think highly of Christ. He says, he says this, thinking about ourselves will produce pride or despair and both are forms of unbelief, kind of in opposite directions. See, we have a tendency to think too highly of ourselves. You know, I'm in a career of teaching math. And, you know, and every, every now and then, from time to time, I hear coworkers say what? They say, we're overworked and we are underpaid, right? You guys know it because I realize, oh, that's not just this thing that is said in teaching circles. It's other people say it about their, their jobs. I'm overworked and I'm under, underpaid. We tend to think this. We tend to inflate our value. Now, listen, do you know who says that they are underworked and overpaid? Do you know who says that? Nobody. Who said, I heard somebody say nobody. You got it. Nobody says that. Nobody says, oh, I'm so underworked and overpaid. We tend to say I'm overworked and underpaid. We have a tendency to inflate our value. Now, uh, where are the glasses? I don't know if they've made it all the way around. Oh, we've kind of, okay, so we've hit this half. So this half knows what they look like. Uh, this half is still experiencing the glasses here. Uh, I was trying to time it so that at this point, everyone would have had the chance to put the glasses on. So what did you guys see when you looked around with the glasses? <laughs> what, a blur? Yeah, you, could, you, you had some semblance of the room, but you had a distorted value of the room, right? Sorry, I'm, my vision's 2800. It means I can't see the big E when you go to the eye doctor. So I'm sorry if anybody got a headache. You guys will experience it in a minute. Maybe you choose not to now. But we, we have a distorted view. I call them sin goggles. Not those glasses. But the tendency to distort or inflate our value to sin goggles. Paul says, don't look too highly on, don't look at yourself too highly. Look at yourself with sober judgment. Have a right view of yourselves. The key idea, well, key idea one anyway, is that we all have sin goggles that tend to inflate ourselves and our value. We all have it. We, even if we understand the gospel, even if we understand that Christ died for our sins and I'm not as good as I thought I was, we still have a hard time correctly evaluating ourselves. I tend to think this. I think we have about a 20% inflated view of our own gifts, abilities, and contributions. And some of you might, oh, it's not 20%, it's 28% or it's 18%. I, I tend to think it's around 20%. We have a roughly 20% inflated view of ourselves and our, our contributions and our abilities. It's the sin goggles. Now think about the implications of this in church ministry or in working just with other people in general. 
Why do we sometimes have jockeying and conflict uh, among ourselves? You know, Peter, or I'm sorry, Peter, uh, James, in James 4, would suggest it's, it's the passage in front of us, right? The passage inside us that uh, we want something and we don't get it, right? You want the promotion, somebody else got it. You think they're, that you do your job better than them. You deserved it, right? And it might be true, or we all, we all have this tendency to inflate our value by about 20%. But think about it, if I've got a 20% inflated view of myself and I'm working with somebody that has a 20% inflated view of themselves, you could have two equally gifted people, equal ability, both thinking, I could do this thing way better than that person doing it. It's the sin goggles. In Turkey, we were working on, on planting a church with another American couple, and the guy's name is Chuck. And I would listen to Chuck talking to someone in Turkish. And I would inwardly be, inwardly be thinking, my Turkish is a lot better than this guy's. And honestly, I didn't think it was that close. And then one day, I was walking with a guy, a, a mutual friend. It wasn't too droll, it was another guy. Uh, but a mutual friend who knew me and Chuck very well. And just kind of off the cuff, uh, matter of factly, he said, yeah, you guys speak about the same level of Turkish. At first, I was floored. I thought maybe he's trolling me. He's messing with me. And then he actually started giving me the receipts. He's like, yeah, you know, Chuck is better at this and this and this. And then maybe you're a little bit farther along in this and this. I was shocked. Because I was like, well, no, there's no way. I know how Chuck speaks Turkish. And then I was like, well, wait. This guy's saying we're, we're on the same level. And then I remember the sin goggles principle that I've been telling people about for a long time. We have a roughly 20% inflated view of ourselves. And then I thought, oh, wait a minute. The real funny thing is, I bet you if you ask Chuck right now, who speaks Turkish better, I bet you he thinks he speaks a lot better than I do. That's the sin goggles. Now, I'm sure Tudor has a, an opinion on this. I don't want to hear it from him. Uh, I'm afraid of what he might say. Uh, but you can ask him some other time. But how does this apply to ministry? So Paul's going to start to talk to us about using our gifts to serve God in the context of the, of the body. It means that as we think about all the aspects of serving, where do I plug in? How can I be involved? What are my spiritual gifts? That we need to have a posture of humility. Oh, the glasses made it back to me, and they didn't get broken. <laughs> all right. <laughs> yes, they, everything's blurry when we put those goggles on. So we got to realize we, ha Yikes. we have these on, Maybe, I don't want to say all the time, but a lot. And a lot of times we don't realize that we have them on. So I'm going to challenge you kind of this uh, through, uh, as we look at the passage, with five reality checks. And the five reality checks are meant to kind of point us to, huh, do I have the sin goggles on? Do I have a posture of humility or a posture of pride in this particular area? Because the, the charge is going to be, look on and show up with sober judgment. Don't have the sin goggles on. So how do we know that? Uh, so these reality checks are going to be meant to help us see, ah, you know what? I need, I need to grow in that. I need to recognize that. So we need to have a posture of humility, having a right understanding of ourselves. Don't think more highly of yourself. It says think with sober judgment. Take off the sin goggles. So the first way that the sin goggles can hinder our ability to serve is that it, could, it may prevent us from doing the things necessary to equip ourselves to serve best in, in whatever ways we're serving. I mean, think about it. If we think that we're pretty good at something or we think we're doing a pretty good job, if we have a 20 to 30% inflated view of ourselves, then we may not ask for help. We may not take constructive criticism very well. Think, no, I got this. We, we may not really want to receive more training to do something better. So our first reality check, think about the ways in which you serve. You know, how do we know if we've got these sin goggles? I don't know. How, how do we know if I'm seeing a distorted view of reality or an actual correct sober view of reality? How do I know that? The first one is think about the ways in which you're serving. In what ways are you proactively trying to get better at what you're doing? If, if we're not, 
that means we may have the sin goggles on. We may have an inflated view of ourselves. Having a posture of humility reinforces to us that we don't have it all figured out yet, that there's room to grow. We should want to grow. We want to do things to the best of our ability. We should want to grow. Having a posture of humility reinforces that. Second, it may affect the types of things that we're willing to do. There are a lot of aspects of ministry that are thankless, menial, less desirable. But somebody needs to do them. If I've got my sin goggles on, if I'm looking at myself like this, I may tend, I may tend to avoid the things that I think, ah, that's maybe beneath me. I may tend to avoid the menial, less desirable things. I told you at the beginning that I was asked to help out at a youth event downtown a couple years ago. And I was excited to be able to use some of my experience in ministry to serve in this way. Well, I got there, got downtown, got to the, to the arena, found out what my role for the night was going to be. So there was going to be a speaker sharing the gospel. But there was going to be other things as well. Before the speaker, they were going to have contests with big bouncy balls. I'm not talking about little bouncy balls. Big bouncy balls being hit throughout the crowd. And they needed me to retrieve the bouncy balls when they went out of bounds. I was a bouncy ball retriever. Not to be confused with the golden retriever. I, I felt undervalued, underutilized. Thoughts of, this is a waste of my time. I, it was an awful night. Not because the night was awful. It was an awful night because I had the sing goggles on. Now, here's the thing about sin goggles. We don't always realize that we have them on when we have them on. I didn't realize I had them on at the time. Flash forward to a couple months ago. I'm hanging out with Keith Allen and Brian Reed, and I'm telling them this story. But the context of the story was not that, oh, yeah, this one time I had the sin goggles on. The context of the story was the low of the last five years since we've been back from Turkey. And as I described the story to them, you know, sometimes you feel real justified in your head, like, I'm justifiably angry about this or justifiably correct. And then you, you say stuff out loud to somebody and you're like, oh, I kind of sound like an arrogant, not so nice person right now. And I didn't, I, so I went home that night. I was like, guys, I'm probably thinking, who do you think you are? What gives you the right? That's why we need alongside us helping us through this stuff. We don't always see our blind spots. We don't always see that. Ah, I'm viewing this the wrong way. See, the sin goggles that night were causing me to focus on what I could bring to the table, how I was being used or not being used, rather than focusing on what God was doing in the, in the lives of the teens through that event. See, sin goggles will have us serving on our terms. But having a right view of ourselves will cause us to say, I am happy to serve in whatever way necessary for the glory of God would have caused me to say, I will gladly and joyfully retrieve bouncy balls for the kingdom of God. See, sin goggles may cause us to avoid the menial but necessary tasks of the ministry. They needed somebody to retrieve those bouncy balls. How are you? But I had a bad attitude about it. Having a posture of humility allows us to take joy in serving the Lord in the spotlight and in the background. And so that's our second reality check, if we can advance it there. What ministry opportunities have you avoided because you think they are beneath you? And maybe it's like, before thinking about it, you're like, these are beneath me. But it's, no. Are we willing to serve the Lord for His glory? We have to have a posture of humility as we look at these verses about service. So let's take a look at verses 4 and 5 together. Verse 4 of, of Romans 12. So, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Now, there are several things that jump out from these verses immediately. It says we are one body. It says we are individually members of one another. There's an investment of one another, an involvement with one another, a care for one another. There's an availability for one another. See, if we're trying to figure out 
how to use our spiritual gifts. The critical and necessary first step is to be around. That's not the last step, but that's the necessary first step is to be around. If you ever played sports, you know what coaches always say is the best ability. Let's see if we know it. What's the best ability in sports? Oh, man, but I thought someone was going to say quarterback or someone's going to say running fast. No, the best ability is availability. Now, Kawhi Leonard is an incredibly gifted basketball player. He plays for the Los Angeles Clippers. Every year, Clippers fans think, this is our year because we have Kawhi. And every year, if you follow basketball, you know this. Kawhi has these mysterious knee soreness injuries, quad soreness, calf tightness. I, I'm, it's not that he's faking. Not questioning his toughness per se, but there's a difference between a ruptured Achilles and knee soreness. Now, if you like Kawhi, don't, I don't want to get too far down that rabbit trail. But as it relates to having an ability, uh, having an availability to becoming individually members one of another, being here regularly is a necessary first step. I realize that there's times where we, we can't make it here on a Sunday. And my goal in saying this is not to make us feel guilty about that. My goal in saying this is to make us realize that every single time we miss a Sunday, we miss out on ministry opportunities. We miss out on opportunities to both use our gifts on others, to show love toward others, and to receive ministry from others. To receive love from one another. We miss out on opportunities to become members of one another. It ought to take a ruptured Achilles to keep us from being here on Sundays. But sometimes it's knee soreness that keeps us away. And so the reality check here is, I'd like you to consider, we can advance it. The reality check is, to what degree do I view Sunday mornings as an opportunity for me to minister to others and for me to receive ministry to, from others? To what degree do I view Sunday mornings with that lens? Now, it's, it's a fair enough question to ask. Well, what's considered an acceptable ruptured Achilles reason? And what's considered an unacceptable knee soreness reason? And I'm not going to try to go through all the reasons we may have for not being here on a Sunday. Because if we're not viewing things with the Romans 12 lens, then all of our reasons, there, there's, there is a, a sense of legitimacy, an element of legit, legitimacy. Question, what's a good reason or a bad reason to miss? It's a fair and reasonable question, but I would suggest it is the wrong question. It's the wrong question. And if we ask the wrong questions, we're going to come up with the wrong answers, right? Romans 6 says, what should we say? Should we sin some more so that grace may abound? He's saying, that's the wrong question. It's not how much can I sin and still be okay. It's That's the wrong question. So we ask the wrong questions, we get wrong answers. So the thing I'm challenging us to do is to view Sunday morning with all the believers gathered as an opportunity to minister to others and to receive ministry from others. So that's the reality check. To what degree do I view Sunday mornings through that lens? I suggest that's the lens that Romans 12 is asking us to use. Verse 5, which we've already read, says, we though many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. And then in verse 6, it says, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. In other words, find opportunities to use the things that God has given you for helping others. Saying, find ways to do that. There's nothing special about it being a Sunday morning. The special thing is, it's the time in the week where we're all gathered in one place. So that's the reality check. To what degree do I view Sunday mornings through that lens? So we've seen that an inflated view of self can limit our ministry. Either we're not trying to get better at whatever we're doing, or we're choosing not to do the menial thing. So an inflated view of self can limit our ministry. And now we're seeing a lack of availability can be an inhibitor to our ministry. But I want to look at something else that can limit it. Read verses 6 through 8 together. And we already read verse 6. I'm going to read 6, 7, and 8 together. It says, Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy 
with cheerfulness. Now, we've already touched on verse 6 regarding the let us use them aspect. I want to now look at the fact that we have, it says we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. The thing that needs to be highlighted here is that we've all been given gifts. It is certainly understandable that sometimes we may feel like we have nothing to give. In fact, sometimes people may not come to church because they feel like they have nothing to give or nothing to contribute. The encouragement from this passage is we have we all have things to be able to contribute. You may notice I, I'm not going to be defining and going uh, far in depth with what each of these gifts is and, and that type of thing. This is a partial list. There's another partial list in 1 Corinthians 12. There's, another, there's some more descriptors in 1 Peter 4, verses 10 and 11. It's not meant to be an exhaustive list. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 gives us a definition of a spiritual gift that helps kind of put our, our hands around it. It says, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So 1 Corinthians 12, 7 is doubly helpful. Because it says, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit. Everyone has a manifestation of the Spirit. And then it also says, to what end? It's for the common good. So we have things given to us by God that are for the help and benefit of other people. And they're not all going to show up in that list. The list isn't meant to be exhaustive. So the spiritual gifts that we have are meant for usage. But there are times where, for whatever reason, man, we don't feel like using our gifts. And I don't think we have bad motives for not using our gifts. It's usually not laziness. Usually not lack of desire. A lot of times, it has to do with confidence. Or that, well, what do I really have to contribute? What can I really do? It has to do with confidence. If I do this thing, will it actually be helpful? Will it be successful? Will the person actually like that I reached out? Or will it be rejected? Or do I actually have this spiritual gift? And I know this may sound counterintuitive, but the same thing, pride, that causes us to typically inflate our value, can also do something else. I'm wondering if... When you looked at the, the, the key idea number one, and it said that uh, our sin goggles inflate our value, if anyone was protesting at the time, I'm like, well, I tend to think negatively about myself. Well, if anyone was thinking that, now would be the time. We need to actually adjust. If you're taking notes, you need to cross off one word. All right? So our sin goggles, we said that our sin goggles inflate our view of ourselves and our value. More generally, our sin goggles distort our view of ourselves and our value. See, sometimes we might have an inflated view of what we bring to the table. There's other times where we may be feeling pessimistic about ourselves. It may be a seat. I don't think that there's deflated people and inflated people. I think we go in seasons where, or sometimes it's within a week, where I'm alternating between feeling like I've got a ton to give and then feeling like I've got nothing to give. So sometimes, I guess if you want to think about it through the lens of the glasses, no pun intended, sometimes these things work nearsighted, sometimes they work farsighted, sometimes we have an inflated view of self, sometimes we have a deflated view of self. Now yeah, the emphasis in 12.3 was don't look too highly upon yourself, then it says look on yourself with sober judgment, don't think too lowly of yourself either. Self-confidence issues can, can keep gifted people from using their gifts. The encouragement from Scripture is that, yes, each one of us has something to give, even in seasons where we're not feeling like we have much to give. And it, it takes a step of faith towards someone to use that gift. It doesn't take feeling wonderful. It takes a step of faith towards someone. Years ago, we had a basketball league at Grace. And at that time, the Browns field goal kicker, Phil Dawson, was a member here of the church. And I had heard him speak at a couple of our youth group meetings, and it struck me that he was a really gifted teacher of the Bible. So I approached him with an idea. The idea was that on the last night of our basketball league, he would share his testimony in front of all the, all the players in the league, and then he would lead a four-week follow-up Bible study. We spent a lot of time organizing this. We got together to make a plan. We we're hoping for big things. So the last night of the league, he shared his testimony in front of everybody in, in the league. And then the Bible study started the following week. 
and then nobody really came to the Bible study. And I was deflated. Now, when I say that nobody really came to the Bible study, you need to realize I just gave you guys false information. It's about six to eight people. Some weeks, maybe five, some weeks, six, some weeks, seven. I said, no. It felt like, oh, no, I don't know how many we were expecting, how many I was hoping for, 20, 30, 40, but not five or six or seven. I hate when we do that, right? When you say when, when five, six, seven people come, and you say nobody really came, what are you doing? You are eradicating the value of those five or six or seven people that came. I don't know how many people we wanted to come, but more than that, in my mind. It's like the disciples. They've got five loaves of bread. they got two fishes. What do they say to Jesus? We have nothing but five loaves and two fishes. Don't tell me what you don't have. Look at what you do have. Now, we had a nice time with, with the, those small numbers, but I tell you, I was feeling deflated the whole time. It was a learning experience for me. One of the guys that came was a friend of a guy named John. Now, John was a member of our church. His best friend came to those Bible studies, came every week. It was the start of him reading his Bible. Eventually, he got saved. He started attending here. Pastor Steve performed his wedding. He ended up supporting our ministry in Turkey. And at the time, in my mind, it was like, oh, nobody really came. You know who wasn't saying nobody really came? John, whose best friend came. It was a big deal for him. He was thrilled. Oh, yeah, and the part that I had kind of discounted. I kind of discounted Phil's testimony on the last night of the league. I was focused on the four-week Bible study. Turns out that it had struck home with somebody there, one of the players from the league. That player went home. Now, he didn't come to the Bible study, but that player went home. He started telling his wife, hey, we need to start going to church. And then he and his wife started coming to church. It was Mike McGregor and his wife, Jill, my sister. I don't say nobody really came when a few came. These are the few that the Lord brought. And it's in ministry to him that we serve. Everybody wants two to the X. Why do we want two to the X? Because exponential growth. Why do we want exponential growth? Because it's the fastest. Is growth bad? Well, no, of course not. But if the Lord gives us X and we are endlessly searching for X plus 5 or 2X or X squared or X cubed, and yes, this is the math portion of the sermon, or 2 to the X, I, it's, it's great to pray for 2 to the X or X plus 5. But here's the point. Don't miss it. We better be thrilled about serving the Lord to the X while we are praying for the X plus 5 or the 2X. Otherwise, if we can feel dejected. The same sin goggles that can inflate our view of ourselves when things go well can deflate our view of ourselves when things don't go as we would have liked. Confidence issues can keep us from taking a step of faith. It's why in the membership application, we ask the question, if you could do anything as a ministry and be guaranteed not to fail, what would it be? Now, obviously, there's no guarantee that something's going to be successful or work. The point of the question is that sometimes fear of failure, fear of rejection, these are real issues that hinder gifted people from taking that first step. It's not that we can guarantee success. It's that we want to be thinking, how has the Lord shaped and used and use me in the past? How has he shaped me? What gifts has he given to me? And then how can I use that for his glory and trusting him with the results? It's not about what we bring to the table or what we can do. It's about God using us to accomplish his purposes. A lack of confidence, fear of failure is real, and it prevents real people from taking steps that they ought to take. Did you catch what Piper said? Thinking about ourselves, he said, will produce pride or despair. And both are forms of unbelief. Maybe stated differently, both are forms of belief in self. Pride in self when things are going well. Despair in self when things go poorly in our eyes. Now, no doubt, the first one's way more obnoxious. You know, the guy that's completely inflated and acting like that, that's way more obnoxious. But they're both a form of unbelief. 
The straightforward way of reading verses 6 through 8 of Romans 12 is to say, whatever you've got, find a way to use it. Take that step. If teaching, teach. If exhortation, exhort. If serving, serve. Everybody has something to contribute. The sin goggles may keep us feeling as if we have nothing to contribute right now. I look at myself and how I'm feeling right now, and I think, I can't really do it. What's the point if it's not really going to be successful? We're still seeing, I can still see a congregation up here, but it's very blurry. I, it's, I'm not seeing things right. Everybody has something to contribute. So the fourth reality check, if we can go on to the next one. The fourth reality check, what ministries have you avoided because of a lack of confidence or a fear of failure, even though you'd like to get involved? The synagogues can work nearsighted and farsighted. They could inflate our value at times. We've got to have a check on that. They could deflate our value at times. Make it feel like we have nothing to give. All of us have something to give. Now, this last aspect uh, deals with the descriptors on a few of the gifts. So you may notice in verses 6, 7, 8, there's a, a partial list of the gifts. And for some, it just says, if exhortation, then in his exhortation. If teaching, then in his teaching. Find a way to use it. Don't let absenteeism or a fear of failure keep you from using your gifts. That's what it says. But then, for a few others, there are descriptors that indicate something else that can hinder the use of our gifts. So look at the second part of verse 8. It says, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. So here, he's not just saying, oh, just do it. Like with Psalm, here he's saying how to do it, with what attitude to do what we're doing. With generosity, with zeal, with cheerfulness, try to kind of put these under one umbrella, the, with the attitude of wholeheartedness. Wholeheartedness. Now, what's the opposite of wholeheartedness? I'm curious what you're going to say. What's the opposite of wholeheartedness? I couldn't hear it. Begrudgingly, okay. I was hoping somebody would say empty heartedness. And it's not empty heartedness. Because empty heartedness is like someone who said, no, I'm no longer going to minister here. Someone else can do it. The opposite, I'd say, of whole heartedness is half heartedness. Half heartedness is the worst. And yet we're all susceptible to it. But it is the worst. It's the person doing it. For the wrong reasons. And that's where you can say, uh, I think, uh, Amy, you said begrudgingly, right? <laughs> you're doing it half-heartedly. You're doing it for the wrong reasons. I don't really want to be there. Now, try to make it sound ugly. But again, I do want us to realize, and the reality check is hopefully going to allow us to, to check our heart on this, that we are all susceptible to this. We can get comfortable in, in the ways that we're serving to the point where we don't give the ministry the proper attention, planning, and prayer that it requires. See, half-heartedness has the idea of withholding something. I'll give financially, but the minimum. I'll lead that meeting, but I'll wing it. I'll help out that person, but with a prayer rather than a visit. Why we all need to be careful of this. I think that the longer that we're doing a particular ministry, the more susceptible we may be to half-heartedness. I had a rougher year in teaching this past year, in part due to a few rough kids. And another teacher, a guy in his 60s, who has been teaching for almost 40 years, had a few of these same kids. What do you think his attitude was like? This guy's been teaching for 40 years. He's got some bad kids. What do you think this guy's attitude was like? What's that? Negative, you would think. This guy is helping me, though. This guy is having conversations with me about these kids to see the way that he approaches people. At 40 years of doing this, here's what he would tell me over and over. These kids need to see consistency and stability from us because they may not be getting it anywhere else in their life. It was such a refreshing attitude from a guy that you would think about hey, if half hardness or burnt outedness is going to kick in on anybody. Maybe it's somebody that's been doing the same thing for 40 years. Not with this guy. Refreshing, positive attitude. Not a positive attitude that pretends that hard things don't exist, but a positive attitude that says, I will continue to give everything 
that I have to this, even in light of tough circumstances. How much more then in church ministry should we be zealous and generous and cheerful, wholeheartedly doing the ministries that the Lord has called us to? And so that's our fifth reality check. Oh, I guess it's working again. In what ways has half-heartedness seeped into your ministry? Again, these are sin goggles, meaning it's like we've got them on. We don't always realize that we're seeing a distorted picture. We think, no, I'm always wholehearted. I never have too high of a view of myself. I never have a lack of confidence. We might think that, and then the goal of these questions is to, to do a heart check to see where are these things actually, where have they started to take hold? The passage is telling us, take off the sin goggles and serve. And that's the key idea, too. It's really just an extension of key idea one, if you can advance it, please. Let's take off the sin goggles and serve. So the 24-7 worshiper part of this is going to be to take yourself through those reality checks. See, this is not easy. It's simple. It's, it's a simple, basic enough thing to say, but it's not easy. It's not easy because we tend to have a distorted view of ourselves, either keeping us from trying to get better or preventing us from doing things that we think are beneath us. It's not easy because we're not always available. It's not easy because we have fears or maybe we feel like we have nothing to give. It's not easy because we can sometimes be on autopilot and have hardness. It's not easy, but it's attainable. It's why we're in fellowship with one another. We, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them. Our motivation is based all entirely on the mercies of God. The indicative before the imperative. It goes back to by the mercies of God that he's shown to us. The first 11 chapters of Romans talking about the mercies of God given to us. Now we get to specific ways of becoming living sacrifices. It's, this is attainable. It's why we're in fellowship with one another. It is worth the mental and spiritual surgery that we need to have on ourselves. Sort through the reality checks. So you've got the, uh, the reality checks. Are you trying to get better at the things that you are involved in? Are there things that you would consider beneath you? Things that you're avoiding because they're beneath you? Are we viewing Sunday mornings as ministry opportunities? Have we avoided any ministry opportunities because of a lack of confidence or a fear of failure or a feeling of, I have nothing to contribute. Has half hardness seeped in. So your homework is to maybe journal with that. Maybe if you're a verbal processor, talk with somebody about it. Talk about the ways that those things may have seeped in. As an alongsider, so as I said, one of the things that we did not get into is looking at the specific gifts and, and defining those and, and looking at the list in different places. Brainstorm ways to serve by meeting with another believer. So drink some expensive coffee this week. Go to Panera, go to Starbucks, meet somebody somewhere and do these two things. Share ways, and again, this is a brainstorm. How, in what ways can I serve the body of Christ? Brainstorm by, in the context, so read 1 Corinthians 12. Read Romans 12, the verses that we've talked about. And then share ways in which you've ministered in the past, in which you've shown love and helped other people in the past. And share the things that you've actually received from other people that have been helpful to you in the past. Share those, and then don't be the me monster. Also listen to the other person share as well. So in that mutual sharing, here's how I've served in the past. Here's how I've helped other people in the past. And here's how other people have helped me in the past. As you're both sharing, you kind of get a general idea. Ah, these things are helpful. Maybe you jump in on one of those things. And as a go person, as a go person, we're talking about using our gifts to help other people. So as a go person, use those same love-showing gifts for people who don't know the Lord yet. This passage is 
is telling us to take off the sin goggles and serve. Reflect on the ways that an inflated view of self or a deflated view of self has hindered us and serve for the glory of God. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that it pierces the soul and spirit, bone and marrow. Lord, pray that you would show us how you want us to respond to this. You'd help us to, to find ways to serve, Lord. Help us to use the things that you've given to us. Lord, pray that uh, you would keep an inflated or deflated view of self from, uh, from preventing us from serving, Lord. Pray that you would help us to serve in a whole heart, with, with a whole heart, Lord. Thank you that you give us these opportunities. In Jesus' name we pray.